Have the Baltimore Ravens found their inside linebacker duo of the future in Roquan Smith and Patrick Queen? We dive into that and more coming up here on this episode of Locked on Ravens. You are Locked on Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And we return here with another episode of Locked on Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Allstriker of Ravens Wire. We're here on the Locked on Podcast Network, of course, your team every day. Thank you so much for tuning in, making us your first listen of the day for an available on all platforms, including on YouTube. So if you're here with us on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to this channel, like the video if you're listening to audio forum. Be sure to follow along on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Ravens content five days a week over here. So be sure to Tune in to all the stuff we have going on. And this episode of Locked on Ravens is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. We're back. It's a midweek edition. The day before Thanksgiving, Baltimore comes out of week 11 with a 13-3 win over the Carolina Panthers. Uh, not the win many were expecting, but hey, again, a win is a win, and that is what shows up. On the record. And so Baltimore is now seven and three. Their winning streak is four. We're going to be diving into a bunch of things today. We're going to be talking about mailbag questions, but the main focus of today's show is going to be about Roquan Smith and Patrick Queen. Is obviously Baltimore acquired Roquan Smith and the Chicago Bears in exchange for a second rounder, a fifth rounder, and AJ Klein. And I want to talk about just if Roquan Smith and Patrick Queen are the Ravens inside linebacker duo of the future. It's only been a couple of weeks of seeing those guys playing with each other, but the returns have been very positive, so we'll talk about that in the second segment. And the first time, we'll just do a little bit more of recap for the Carolina game, just kind of putting a bow on that and wrapping it up as we move into Week 12. And then in the final segment, we'll be talking about more mailbag questions, talking about the Ravens being a playoff team. We'll talk a bit about Devin Duvernay, Mark Andrews, and more. So let's now dive into it here. We'll start off with the Panthers game again, 13-3 to win, and, and luckily it was a win for them. I know it was a little iffy throughout the entire contest offensively, Baltimore only three points heading into the fourth quarter. It was a 3-3 game heading into the fourth quarter. But look, there were windy conditions, and there, there were a couple of contributing factors. But the, one of the things, and I've talked about it throughout the course of the week so far, is that Carolina's defense has talent on it. But the thing is, they were middling. They were a middling unit, both rush defense-wise and pass defense-wise. And so the Baltimore offense has shown the flashes, and they showed that consistency at least – from the second half of that Tampa game to the full game of the Saints one. So I think a lot of people were expecting, hey, you know, they're coming off of a bye, they're well rested, and then all of a sudden they sputter and they can't run the ball as effectively as they want it to be run. And then you have Demarcus Robinson and Mark Andrews having over 180 yards combined receiving, actually over 190 combined yards receiving. Demarcus Robinson 128, Mark Andrews 63, but then Justice Hill had eight yards. That was the third leading receiver on the Ravens and Devin Duvernay is not getting touches. So it's all this stuff in the Ravens. Talk, right, John Harbaugh talked about it on Monday where the coaches know they have to get the ball in Duvernay's hands. And the, the, over the course of the game, there were plays that were schemed up to get him touches, but just game flow happened. And so at the same time, look, I mean, I get that stuff happens during the course of a game and we'll talk about Devin Duvernay throughout the show here, but he is your, he is one of your most dynamic weapons on offense. And we have seen time and time again good things happen. I talked a bit about this point on Monday's show where I'm like, look, this isn't like an experiment where we're trying to see what Devin DuVernay is. Like, obviously, there's still room for him to grow, but we know what happens when the ball's in his hands. Usually, usually it's good things. <laughs> usually good things happen. So, I mean, offensively, I know it is It is frustrating that Baltimore only scored 13 points and seemingly got into the rhythm when the defense gave him the ball back. But that's just that's what happens in the NFL. Sometimes wacky, weird games like this happen, and the Ravens – have to figure it out moving forward. As I, as we've said throughout the course of the week so far, it's not a performance that would get you past the Buffalo. And I know some people are saying, yeah, you can get past the Buffalo or Miami or Kansas City with this performance on offense. And I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that wholeheartedly. I think it's possible, but Buffalo and all those teams, Kansas City, Miami, they're they're good. They're too good. Carolina's offense is not good, right? Baker Mayfield is reeling. DJ Moore is kind of trapped over there. Down to yeah, the form is good as well, but. 
the, the Carolina offense was not putting up points on this Ravens defense because the Ravens defense was so dominant in this one. But you can't always assume the team's just going to score three points on your defense. You have to be able to be better offensively. So, yes, it was an ugly win. It was frustrating, but it still was one that was a win regardless. But it was not frustrating defensively for the Ravens. as Their defense, again, was just – was just unbelievable in this game. And it goes to show what happens over the course of a year, right? Where over the course of the first month of the year, maybe six weeks, right? When the Giants game happened, there were a lot of questions about how the defense, and even in the Giants game, that wasn't necessarily the the defense's fault or anything, right? The offense gave the ball back to the Giants offense and really, really good field position. And the defense had to work with a short field. But the Miami game is the one people always go back to where, you know, the big plays, the blown fourth quarter lead. It, it was just, that was not an acceptable performance by the defense in that fourth quarter. And I think they have tightened up ever since then. And there have been multiple perspectives as to why that kind of happened. Patrick Queen has talked a bit about it. Mike McDonald has kind of shed some light into it. But regardless, they're playing well now. And that's what matters. And they're playing well at the right time. We're able to get those kind of early season mistakes, early season jitters out then. And then you're able to go and perform at the highest level. You want to be performing high at a high level now, right? November or late November, December, January, February. Those are the months you want to be able to be at your tip, the tip top performance, your peak shape. That's what Baltimore's defense is right now. And they're still going to get guys back healthy. You know, once Marcus Williams comes back and some of these other guys as well, David Ajabo's debut, they have guys still waiting in the wings. And that I think is a key for them because Marcus Williams was playing a lights out football when he went down with his injury. David Ajabo has the potential to at least be a rotation piece in this defense. Now they have a lot of outside linebackers and good ones. So it's not to say he's going to be playing all these snaps, but this defense still has so much potential to be better and they're only getting better right now. So look, there, there might be a game or two here or there where it slips up a little bit and we're not seeing these three point, you know, performances or really, really good third down performances that they've given. I mean, the Ravens defense, I'll, I'll read a stat out that I put out on Twitter on Sunday after the game where it's unbelievable what the Ravens defense has done on third down over these last four weeks. And it's a key down on the third down conversions for their defense over the past four weeks, week seven against the Browns, two of 11 conversions allowed week eight at the Buccaneers, four of 13 conversions allowed week nine at the Saints, they have three of 11 conversions allowed and week 11 against the Panthers, three of 12. That's a total of 12 for 47 conversions allowed 25.5%. We've talked about for the Ravens, how important it is for them to be able to convert on third down on offense, get the ball rolling, get the momentum going and sustaining those long drives. There are a couple of things that a defense is doing when they stop that offense on third down. One, it is giving the ball back to your offense, which is obviously a huge plus, but two, you're not letting the offense get momentum. You're not letting the clock keep draining and draining and draining. You're able to force the momentum back onto your side and eventually something's going to hit, right? It's very rare that it doesn't hit. And sometimes it does, don't get me wrong, but it's very rare that offenses can't capitalize on that, especially an offense like Baltimore's that should have better success running the ball in the coming weeks here, should have the passing offense continue to step up. Now, it's not like their wide receiver core is the best in the league right now, right? That's not what it is but they have contributors that can at least just do something out there. So you have to be able to take it for what it is. You don't have a Stephon Diggs out there. You don't have a DeAndre Hopkins out there. This is what, this is what Baltimore built. And I, I talked about how I wanted to see them add somebody outside of Demarcus Robinson and they didn't do it. So this is what they have now. And I still think they can win with it, but it's going to run through Mark Andrews, the pass offense, obviously run through the tight ends. That's just what it is. But you can have the contributions of a Demi DuVernay, a Demarcus Robinson game like we saw in this one, and still be able to work with it while I think sticking to your identity, which is still running the football. And Baltimore ended up throwing the ball a little more than they ran it against Carolina. I just – they were trying to get something going. But I think we will see the Ravens offense continue to use the ground game to their advantage because I think that is what they do best. And that's not a slight on the passing game. I still think they have a solid passing attack. But I think you run with the run with this offense, run with this offensive line, this play great. And I think good things happen overall. But coming up here in our second segment, we'll be diving into Roquan Smith and Patrick Queen talking about those two guys. And if they are the future at inside linebacker for the Baltimore Ravens, so be sure to stay tuned. Still a ton to talk about here on the show. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. 
therapy online. And there are a bunch of times where I've wished that life comes with a user manual and that our help online is basically the next best thing, but life doesn't come with that user manual. So when it's not working for you, it is normal to feel stuck, but therapists are trained to help you figure out the cost of challenging emotions and learn productive coping skills, which makes therapy the closest thing to a guided tour of the complex engine called You Better Help is connects to over 3 million people with licensed therapists. It's convenient, secure, and accessible anywhere 100% online. And there are so many benefits to therapy, such as learning coping skills. You have self-empowerment, dealing with trauma and more. And there's so many people who have benefited from therapy all the time. And everyone deserves to feel their best. Better help makes it easier to get started. As the world's largest therapy service, they've matched millions of people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists have available 100% online. All the benefits of in-person therapy plus is more convenient, more accessible, and more affordable. You just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. And if things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It really couldn't be simpler. There are no waiting rooms. There's no traffic and no endless searching for the right therapist. Get unstuck with BetterHelp. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash locked on. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked on. We're back here. Our second segment of Locked on Ravens here on Wednesday. Kevin Oshrek, your host, still here with you again. Thank you so much for tuning in and making us your first listen of the day here. But let's now dive into a really good question that was brought up for our mailbag, actually. We're going to be talking about a question from Sunshine030849, who asks, what is the comparison of Patrick Queen's play versus Roquan Smith? And so this really, it brought me to the topic of the day, which is, are Roquan Smith and Patrick Queen the duo of the future for the Ravens at inside linebacker? I mean, just early, early comparisons. Both of them have similar-ish skill sets, but they're not redundant skill sets. Both have really good sideline to sideline speed. When space is freed up for them, they're able to get a runner down and just be able to shoot a gap and attack really well. Both are really aggressive players. And I think if, if you're looking for differences, like in a way, both do get kind of caught up. Like if there's an if a blocker gets onto them, they can have trouble shedding sometimes. I think both have gotten better, but we've seen with Patrick Queen where he can get washed out of a play when there's a blocker on him. Whereas I think it's key for him to have the defense you know, the defensive line split the seas and have him just have that free running lane. And he's gotten better. I mean, he's, he's been physical. Patrick queen has Roquan Smith also a very physical player. I think the main difference though, is that Roquan Smith excels in coverage. Patrick queen, I think is not there yet where Smith, we saw it against the saints in week nine where Alvin Kamara, you get him out of the backfield and there's a pass to him and Roquan Smith in the open field, one-on-one -on -one, tackles him and he's right there to make the stop. So I think that's an area Patrick Queen can still grow. And I'm not saying he's horrendous and terrible, terrible at it. But I think Roquan Smith is a better player there for me right now than Patrick Queen is. But these are also two different players where Roquan Smith is on his fifth year option at this moment. Whereas for Patrick Queen, he's only in his third season. But I still think that both play really well next, next to each other. There are questions, right? There were questions about how well Roquan Smith and Patrick Queen were going to be able to mesh together, play with each other, play off of each other. But both guys seemingly look, they, they love each other in the locker room. It looks like already both guys have really come close. It feels like, and again, it's only like the third week here, the Roquan Smith is going to be playing in a Ravens uniform coming up in week 12 against Jacksonville. So both players have shown a knack for getting to the football. Both players have, done a lot of great things already now Patrick Queen has obviously been in Baltimore longer but Roquan Smith has picked up the playbook Mike McDonald just talked about how he picked it up in like two days so he's already there both are really smart as well so I'm excited for both of them and I really hope Baltimore does find a way to keep both I'm not sure how the money would work out so what it would be is obviously this year the Ravens have a lot of decisions to make Lamar Jackson's contract extension has been looming for ever. It seems like it seems like it's been a never ending conversation, but then you have Roquan Smith's extension. Marcus Peters has to be a decision made on him as well. We saw it with the Ravens and kind of losing those star pass rushers when Zadarius Smith walked, when Matthew Judon walked, you, you can't keep everybody. The thing though, with Patrick Queen's potential extension is that they don't have to worry about it for the next two seasons, at least where you still have him for his fourth year. And then if you want to, you can pick up that fifth year option. So if you want to front load a contract here or there or two contracts here and there to be able to fit in a Lamar extension. Maybe there are bonuses here and there. You can do restructures with certain players. A lot of things can fit in here. I think if the Ravens really, really wanted all three, they could get all three under contract, but I think that comes at the cost of something else, right? Maybe you don't sign 
a player in free agency that you really, really want. Or maybe you have to not bring back a Marcus Peters, who I think is really important to re-sign, but the money has to be right for him and it has to be right for the organization. So that's another question that I we'll, we'll get into throughout the course of the remainder of the season as we get into the offseason, whenever that comes for Baltimore. But at the same time, we see what Roquan Smith has done for Patrick Queen. Patrick Queen was already playing really well before Roquan Smith came into the fold. He had ascended in his third year. He had really begun to come into his own. But Roquan Smith, I think, has unlocked a, another aspect of Patrick Queen where I don't think Queen has to necessarily think as much. And I'm not saying he can't think. <laughs> like he's He is still, I still think, a very smart football player. But when he's, he just goes out there and when he plays football, when he's free, he becomes confident in himself. He becomes this guy who is just literally unstoppable. And so I think having Roquan Smith in Baltimore for the impact that he provides himself, but also the impact that he provides for the remainder of the defense is really important. Plus Baltimore gave up a second round pick for him, a fifth round pick for him and AJ Klein and Klein's already in New York right now. He actually already got cut by Chicago. So there's that aspect of the trade, but regardless, it's not jump change to give up a second rounder in the situation. So I think that Baltimore really likes the duo. They're seeing what it is right now, though. If it didn't work, Roquan Smith is in the final year of his deal. They can get back a third round compensatory pick for him if, if everything goes wrong. But so far, everything has gone right. Like this has been great for them to have. And I think that the duo, I would love it if they were in Baltimore long term. I know they would probably really like it. But again, Roquan Smith is not really talking about the contract right now, which I think is the right decision. Same thing with Lamar Jackson. Do you franchise tag one of them? Do you maybe franchise Lamar for a year and sign Roquan to the extension? Do you franchise Roquan? I don't, I don't know how it would work out money wise, but I think it is possible to get all three under contract, especially because you don't have to make the decision on Patrick Queen right away. But I think if you kind of replace Patrick Queen's name with Marcus Peters, then the conversation becomes a bit, a bit more interesting because do the Ravens maybe say, hey, we can take a corner in the first round of this draft here and move on from Marcus Peters? Or do they say he's too important to what we do to let him leave and have this happen where they're relying on more young guys and seeing if they want to risk it there? So I think Roquan Smith and Patrick Queen, the two of them together, you have the coverage ability, you have the big play ability, you have the turnover ability, you have the sideline to sideline speed, yeah, good communication as well. I think both of them are already picking it up and learning. Patrick Queen being a young guy, Roquan Smith being more the, the veteran out of the two of them. Roquan's in his fifth year and Patrick Queen is in his third. But both of them are really explosive, really dynamic players. And when you're talking about like a trade deadline acquisition, Roquan Smith is a two-time All-Pro at 25 for a reason. He's really good. He has already continued to uphold that standard of great middle linebacker play, consistent middle linebacker play that we've seen. But the duo of them, if you can place – two high level inside linebackers next to each other. I know there's been all the conversation about, well, regular base defense, you don't have to play it as much. You can put three safeties on the field. You can use, you know, multiple DB looks instead. If you have the talent of the position, you know, you can do it. Now the question is, do the Ravens want to pay two inside linebackers, right? Because it is a little bit of a controversy in terms of what the position is nowadays, especially in Baltimore, where I know their defensive looks are not necessarily all base. So that's another key question, but I think they could. I think that realistically, these two could be the future of inside linebacker for the Ravens, but it has to work out money-wise. And I don't think you can, you, you can't commit tons and tons of money while just completely neglecting like two or three other positions. That's where everything comes in here, where when you have these players coming off of their rookie extensions, especially a player like Lamar Jackson, who's going to demand massive amounts of money. When you get these guys under contract, other positions, you have to find a way to hit on later rounds in the draft to find veteran minimum players where you're not going to be able to necessarily sign a Marcus Williams every single offseason. So that's the answer there. But at the at the same time, I think that Baltimore does value both players, but we'll see what ends up happening. I think there is a real shot that they could have both these guys playing in Baltimore for a very long time, but there's still a long way to go, right? Again, only two games under the belt for both of these players together in a Baltimore uniform. Roquan Smith is going to be playing in his third game in week 12 against Jacksonville. So we'll see, but I'm excited about both. I'm excited about Roquan Smith and Baltimore. I love them since his Georgia days. So I think the duo will work out and I'm hoping it'll be for a long time in Baltimore, especially if Roquan Smith and Patrick Queen can, can continue their ascensions as players, just is an NFL player at the NFL level. So that's where I am with that coming up though. We're going to be diving into our final batch of mailbag questions. So be sure to stay tuned. Still a ton to dive into talking about Mark Andrews, Devin DuVernay and more coming up on the show. But first, 
This show is sponsored by LinkedIn. And these days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stage wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. I've used LinkedIn for a ton of things throughout my life. And you can really have an easy way to create a free job post on LinkedIn Jobs. You just add your job on the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. You have simple tools you can use, like screening questions that make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience. So you can quickly prioritize who would like to interview and who would like to hire. And it's important to finish the year strong and the right team member could help you do that. That's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash LockedOn NFL. That's LinkedIn.com slash LockedOn NFL to push your job for free. Trust me, just to apply. We're back here rounding out our final segment of Wednesday's edition of Locked On Ravens. Kevin Osbrecker still here with you. And now we're going to be diving into the remainder of our Mailbag questions. We're going to start off with a question from Finley Halliday, who asked, yesterday's game showed once again that more wide receiver depth is needed. Can you talk about who's available and who you think would best improve the offense? Well, it's it's hard to say that there would be a wide receiver at this stage of the season that would necessarily contribute now right away. I mean, there, Odo Beckham's been the obvious name that's been talked about for a really, really long time. I guess Will Fuller is, is another one out there who could help. I think that overall, though, the Ravens are kind of rolling with what they're rolling with right now. I don't see anybody else who could just come in and be better, like be a needle mover. My thing is, do they move the needle? Is this a player that would be better than what they have? And I I don't necessarily think there is this massive upgrade. I think that Baltimore would want to save their money anyway for if they have to address the corner position if someone goes down, maybe have to bring in an extra offensive lineman, another defensive tackle. So I don't. I don't really see. I think look, they they trust Deshaun Jackson. We'll see. I mean, he's already dealing with the with the injury. I think they would call up Andy Isabella before anybody else. I just think they're the pickings are so slim right now that I wouldn't I wouldn't really anticipate them bringing in. I agree that they need more wide receiver depth, but I just don't think there's anyone that would move a needle for me right now that I'd say, oh yeah, go out and get this guy, spend the money, and, and be able to bring him in. So I think they're going to roll with what they roll with, and that's the position they put themselves in. Hopefully they address it more in the offseason, but right now they are at the place where they're going to most likely, barring anything substantial, be relying on somebody who's already within the organization at this point. Next, we'll talk about a question from Dwayne Prophet, who says, though being a top five tight end is Mark Andrews a stumbling block for the Ravens. Oh, it seems as if when he's on the field, defense is cue on him and the ball is forced. But the two games prior to the offense seem better using the other weapons to better results score wise. And this was a, a common question throughout the majority of the week for a lot of people. And I think, look, Mark Andrews is a top two, if not a top one tight end in this NFL. He, he is a phenomenal player for them. I don't necessarily think Lamar, like it was better over the course of the last couple of weeks before the Carolina game, because yes, Lamar Jackson absolutely had to spread the ball around. He was, you know, by proxy forced to do it because he didn't have Andrews, obviously no Bateman as well. But I think hopefully it's a thing of just being able to use Andrews with the weapons here, being able to put Andrews and likely on the field and use them at the same time. I don't think Andrews is necessarily a stumbling block because he's so talented, but at the same time, they have to be better in using him in the right situations and in the right roles. So I don't, I'm not saying like, oh, go, go ahead and trade Mark Andrews because he is absolutely like one of the lifebloods of this Ravens offense. But you have to be able to spread the ball around if you're Lamar Jackson. And, and in the Carolina game in particular, I mean, Demarcus Robinson had nine targets, Mark Andrews had eight targets, and then you had three, four, one, one, three, two, one. So Nine and the eight are the definite ones up there. So maybe if you have Mark Andrews getting six targets and you have the ball spread around a little more, they're getting some of those targets to Devin Duvernay. That's something else. But I don't, I think Andrews, he's a, he's a, he's a must in this offense. I'm not necessarily, I'm not overreacting now. Maybe if it continues throughout the course of the season, then there's a, there's a bigger conversation to be had. But at this point, I'm not necessarily worried about Mark Andrews. I, I think if it continues though, then maybe there's a, there's that different conversation that could be brought up here. Then we have a couple of things from Spike, who says, one, I question the coaching staff's play calling and not practicing as a team. And he also says playoff teams seem to be getting better this time of year. The Ravens don't. I don't, I don't know what you mean by not practicing as a team. I think, I mean, they're practicing right now and they're practicing as a team. Uh, play calling, I can understand a little bit, especially offensively. I think Mike McDonald's done great, but 
there have been situational play calls here, and they're also getting to the line and aspect of play calling, which I think has to be better both play calling wise and execution wise. And then for the second part, I mean, I think Baltimore is getting better. Again, we still have a lot of way. We have a lot of way to go in this season. I think the offense has to get it together. Like the defense to me is playing great. I'm not worried about the defense, even if there's a performance here or there that is a little less than people are expecting. If the offense can start hitting on all cylinders, if that can be a thing, if the Ravens can start running the ball more effectively, consistently, if the Ravens can start passing the ball more effectively, consistently converting consistently, consistency is the key thing here then I think that this team has all the potential in the world, but they have to do that because if they don't, there might be a slip up in the regular season here. There are Jacksonville's a talented football team, even though their record doesn't say they are, they're better than their record indicates. So they have to take every opponent seriously. I think they do, but they have to just start faster. I mean, these slow starts for them recently have not been great. I mean, the Saints game wasn't really a slow start. That was just domination, but Buccaneers game, slow start. We've seen it throughout the course of the year, other ways as well. So that's where I am with that. I think they just, they just have to start faster and be more consistent. A question from Jared V says, why has Duve completely disappeared? And I, w- I wish I had an answer for you again. John Harbaugh talked a bit about it on Monday and said, you know, we had scheme touches here and there, you know, got paraphrased, not exactly what he said, but there were opportunities, but they just weren't, they weren't given to fruition. So they have to give him the ball more. He had not, John Harbaugh acknowledged that the team has to give him the ball more, but we've heard that before. I mean, we heard it in like week six and it's now week 12. So they have to actually, do, they have to not go back on their word and give him the ball because he, he's done it. He's been great. And he is dynamic as a receiver, dynamic as a runner, dynamic as a returner. He's our number one wide receiver now too. So I think getting him the ball is going to be really important. I mean, only, what was it? Three targets for Devin DuVernay in this game overall? No, it was one. It was one target for Devin DuVernay, one reception for three yards. He had one carry as well for four yards. That's just, for as talented as as a player as Devin DuVernay is, that cannot be the case. That cannot be the scenario for him. So I don't know why he's disappeared completely. I mean, he and Lamar Jackson have chemistry, but again, the offense, the pass offense does run through the tight ends. It does run through those guys. So that's where I am with Devin Duvernay. Finally, we have something from Lucas Box who says, I'm surprised that you're surprised the offense is not putting up points. They don't have any wide receivers who can regularly get open. There's nothing they can do this late in the season, but just see it through. And it's not, I mean, I'm surprised that the offense doesn't put up points or didn't put up points in the Carolina game because they weren't able to run the ball effectively. I get that they're going to have to probably see through what they have at wide receiver. Again, as I talked about earlier, they did that. To themselves, right? They decided to not adjust the position, and this is where they are right now with no Bateman. Don't have another guy outside of Devin Duvernay, and you know Demarcus Robinson, and you have James Prochet who's dropping passes, and and Tylen Wallace who hasn't really seen the field. But they have to address it in the offseason, definitely this time. I mean, and we've said it for like the past three off seasons, where oh they're going to adjust it this off season, then they like never do, but or at least free agency wise, but. At the same time here, I think the offense can put up points still. This is a talented rushing offense. It also is a talented pass offense too, but you have to be able to run it through the right people pass offense wise. You have to be able to establish the run early and use the play action off of that. So I look, I think Carolina's defense is good. You know, the stats don't necessarily say that, but they have talent there, but against a team like that, you should be able to put up more points than just 13 in the game and only one touchdown throughout the course of the entire game. So I think the Baltimore's offense is still talented. Again, I'm not hitting the panic button right now because we saw the consistency in the Saints game. We saw the good play in week eight against the Buccaneers in the second half. But at the same time, if this Carolina trend continues, then I think a bigger conversation has to be had about it overall. That's all I have you here today on Locked on Ravens. Thank you so much for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe to this channel, like the video on YouTube, follow along with us in audio form as well. Again, five days per week Ravens content here for you every single weekday, Monday, do Friday. When we get back in tomorrow, it'll be Thanksgiving here. So we'll have a Thanksgiving crossover Thursday with Tony Wiggins of Locked On Jaguar. So be sure to stay tuned for that. And I will see you right back here tomorrow.